slides. So yeah, so here to talk about South. Uh, I realize after doing my slides, I always forget to introduce myself. So um, I was an iOS. So I did some C++ and other random development before. Um, but then I was an iOS developer for about three years. Um, I've now been doing Django for about two years. Um, and I have learned to love South. Uh, I'm not like the most expert, expert person in the world, but I've, I've done a lot of South migration in some very ones. Um, so hopefully I can, uh, what I'm expecting out of this talk is that it'll be um, some really great introduction for the people who haven't uh, used it very much. As well as, uh, you know, as we get towards the end, there'll be some kind of interesting uh, things for the more intermediate, advanced folks to look at some more difficult things to do itself. Um, more specifically, uh, I'll go through some detail about how to set up and use South, um, best practices of using South with Git. Um, I, how many people you here use Git for your uh, version control? Oh, great, exactly. <laughs> um, and we'll go through some data integrations, talk about what they are, why you need them, and, and how to do them. And then just a little tiny bit about model inheritance, and then some nice, fun, wacky stuff at the end, which is a little more deep, um, hairy South stuff. So why South? Um, it's kind of two questions, really. Why would you want to use any sort of migrations for your database, as well as why South in particular? Um, Really, as soon as you do any kind of production application, you need to be able to uh, synchronize your database with your code. So as you upgrade your code and you add fields to your models, you need to be able to synchronize that with your database. Um, and if you have multiple developers, uh, you may have a developer who is, you know, has added some fields to the database and another developer who hasn't added those yet. You just want to make sure those people are always in sync. Um, you need to be able to roll back so go from one place uh, in your code, and you're just like, oh, actually, that, you know, that, that didn't work out. Let's roll it back. You also want to be able to roll back your databases at the same time. Um, South is really useful, as Nate mentioned, for migrating data, not just for migrating your schema. Um, and of course, deploying, it synchronizes your, your testing server, your staging server, your you know, production server with all of your development servers. South specifically is the standard for Django. Uh, it's been around for a very long time. It's pretty much what everyone uses. Um, it's also being rolled into Django 1.7. Yay! A lot of people have been arguing for that for a long time to get it as actually part of uh, Django 4. Um, and it is totally awesome and it's pretty fun to use. So uh, that is why you use South. The documentation on South is excellent. So a lot of what I'm going to cover, you could easily learn from the documentation. Um, it's both informative and it's not too much. So I recommend <coughs> going to read the docs and looking at stuff. Um, first, you want to install it. You can just do, and I'm sorry this is so small, um, but pip install, I often, you can do pip install south, or you can do what I did, which is pip install um, dash r requirements, putting in your requirements file where I am. Right now, we have Django and South, um, and it installs South for you. You want to add it to your installed apps. You do a sync DB, and when you do this sync DB, it goes into all of your normal Django stuff, and then it also adds a table called South Migration History, and we'll look at that in a second. Uh, this isn't really part of South, but of course you need to create your application, your you know an app or more than one app, um, and then create some models. So we'll start with something very simple. We have you know kind of a blog. We're gonna have an article. It's gonna have a title, a slug, and some text. Um, and so for each app, you want to set up that app with South. So SouthManage.py, schema migration, the name of your app, which is blog in my case and the dash dash initial. And here it's going through creating a migrations directory. I'll point these out because I'm not sure if you can read them from back there. Um, creating a migrations directory. And then it makes that directory, uses, creates an init file to make that into a package, um, into a module. And then it adds the model blog.article. 
<clears throat> you can also, if you have an existing application, if you already run SyncDB, you already have a bunch of stuff in your database, you can run this convert to south instead of using schema migration happy and initial. And all that does is it runs, it creates an initial uh, migration file. And this will make more sense in a second, so I'll maybe mention it again. And then it fakes that. So it doesn't actually run that migration. So let's talk a little bit about how South works, what it does. When you first set up South, um, it creates a migrations folder inside each of your apps. So if you have five different apps, you do that a migrations folder, it will have an init.py file in it. And, uh, and that's where it'll store all the migration files. It also creates in your database a South migrations history table. And that's where it keeps track of which of those migrations which of the files that it creates in your migrations folders uh, has already been run in the database. So whenever you say schema migration, so basically you're telling yourself, create a schema migration for me, um, what it does is it reads out of your models.py file for that app, and then it creates a migration file that will alter the database. Um, and the point, of course, the, the way that it interacts with your code as it, after it reads from the models is then when you run that migration file, it alters your database schema, and it can also alter the data in your database. Um, so here you can see that it's created a migrations folder, and then uh, when, and that's when I just first create when run the, the, the app, create, um, do an initial migration for the app. Um, it creates, it always numbers your migration, so this one's 0001. Um, and this, when you do an initial or an auto schema migration, uh, it's automatically creating all this code for you. So I didn't write any of this. This is just created by Seth. Um, and you can see that in every migration, there are three important, there are two important pieces, right? One is these definitions of forwards and backwards. And the other one is a dictionary called models. Um, and this, you usually interact only with these two. So it's easy to kind of ignore this. But this is, is an important thing to understand is that when, whenever South creates a migration file for you, it includes in code, in its own file, what it believes to be your model structure at this moment in time. That way it doesn't have to worry about whether the database is in sync with what it's doing right now. It, it ignores the database at the stage, and it kind of freezes your models for this app in the file. Um, and then it creates a forwards migration, and that means it's telling that it's going to make these changes to the database when you run this migration file. But you can also run it backwards, so you can roll back, and so it's going to have a backwards fun definition, uh, function as well, method. Um, so this forwards method creates the table blog article, which has an ID, a title, a slug, and body text. And when it runs it backwards, it deletes that table. Um, if you look in your database, you can see now that I have Oh, and then you need to migrate, and I actually should have put that in there. So the next thing you do is you say um, Python manage.py, migrate. And you can just say migrate and run all of your all of migrations for all of your apps. Or you can say migrate in a specific app, and then it will run the migrations for that app. Um, so in this case, I went ahead and I migrated, and that ran the first migration. So you can see here that in the South Migration History table, it is has recorded that this one has been run. And in my, I can do a Imagine.py migrate list, and it'll give me a list of all of the migrations that have been run for all the apps. And this is very simple, but you can see that in a, an application that's in a running website, these are actually the last three of like seven different apps. Um, and so it's, it's really nice to be able to see, okay, so on all of those migrations, it got up to 25, and I haven't run these yet, and then these have been run, but these have not been run. Um, 
so that when you like pull code from another developer, you can see, oh, I still need to run some migrations. So let's focus just on the top three lines here. Your normal workflow when you're working with stuff. You are going to write some code, and you'll update your model file, um, and then if you update your model file, you want to create a schema migration, and then you want to migrate. You want to run that schema migration file. So this will just do this over and over. You'll, you know, rinse and repeat. So change your model some more. You'll do schema migration, app name dash dash auto. Auto just means create automatically create one for me. That's not the initial one. Um, and then migrate, which runs that file and actually changes your database. So until you say migrate, it doesn't actually change the database, it just creates the file. Um, but often, it might happen that you say to yourself, oh, you know what, actually, I, you know, I wrote some code, I changed my database, but you know what, um, I thought of a, a better way to do this, and so I'm going to migrate backwards. Um, so you can uh, manage that pie, migrate, oh, I should have put this in code text because you don't actually say it backwards. You, you say manage that pie, migrate, and then you can give a specific number. So you can say 0005. So let's say you have seven migrations, uh, and you can tell it to migrate back to five. You can also tell it to migrate all the way back to nothing, which is migrate zero. Um, and then, as long as you haven't pushed your code up anywhere, you can delete those files and redo a migration. So if you realize, you know what, that was just a stupid way to do my model. I don't think I should do it that way at all. And I don't want anyone to know that I didn't write that code. Um, you can migrate back from 7 to 5. You can delete the um, migration files. And redo change, make your changes. And then go ahead and just do scan migration app name auto. And it'll create number 6 for you, as if 6 had never happened. But. Deleting files can actually be very dangerous. Um, and what you want to do, you can delete files as long as you haven't pushed up and no other developer has your code. So if you're the only person on a project, you can do this all the time, it's fine. But if anyone else has your code, then you really never want to delete. So um, let's just say that we have we're here in our blog, we've got authors, we've got a blog, we've got articles. Um, and let's say you have two people. And the developer one is going to work on authors. We've got all the stuff for the authors. The developer two is going to work on the blog part. Um, so developer one updates the author model. And they create a schema migration, which is number two. Um, developer number two is writing code about blogs. And then they pull the schema regression number two. And they apply it. And then the developer number one says, oh, you know what? I shouldn't have done it that way. I'm going to migrate back to one. I'm going to delete my migration number two. I'm going to create a new migration number two, which is much better. Meanwhile, developer number two has written his own code, has pulled uh, this stuff, has migrated, and they get a ghost migration. Now, a ghost migration looks something like this. It's an exception. And it says, these migrations are in the database, but not on disk. So the South Migration History table, your database, has migrations that it thinks have been run. But those migration files have been deleted, and they don't exist anymore. Um, basically, if you've pushed any code up, you never want to delete uh, roll back and delete one of those south migrations. Just make another migration that will change it back. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of like you do things with Git. Like it's really you don't want to be like revert Git and then delete. You rarely want to like delete all of those commits. You really would rather revert them so that you keep the history and then on top of that you just get rid of you undo what you did in that code. So it's very similar. Um, here is another uh, way that you can kind of get into trouble, is um, developer one is working on the office model, and they update it, they do a schema migration uh, to number two, then they update the blog model, they do another schema migration to number three, they push up their code. 
Moving on to bill for number two, this updated blog model, they did skew migration, they did some more updates, they did another skew migration. Each of them has a skew migration labeled number two and another one labeled number three. But they do have separate names because um, South names them useful things. But they begin with two and three. And South likes to do things in a certain order for a very good reason. Um, so this will lead to a conflict. And South does let get. It has a merge feature. So you can just give it, you can, it'll just give you a warning. And then you can tell it, OK, I just want to go ahead and let South try to merge these. And you know, again, it's similar to Git in a lot of ways. Git can often take care of a lot of merges, but then you run into the things where it can't, it can't handle it properly. And the same thing happens with South. So um, in general, uh, it, you don't want to, you want to avoid this problem as much as possible. So what we try to do is um, we just try to have a better Git feng shui. So we try to make sure our Git is always as clean as possible in terms of South. And what that means for South specifically is that you can make all the changes in your code you want. But if you're going to make a change to your model that requires a schema migration, then you must push that code, as minimal amount of code as possible, to the development branch as soon as you can. As soon as you know that that's actually going to be in your code. So what that means is that you can commit code code just in your feature branch. right? You can commit some, you know, any code changes you want. You come to a, a place where you're going to make schema migration. You take the models.py files and the schema migration files. And occasionally there will be some other files that are touched by this as well. But you want to take all of those things and put them in one commit possible. And then um, either just pull that commit directly over to develop or do a cherry pick so that your other developers can get that migration soon. So that they don't end up also working on another branch and creating uh, schema migrations that can kind of overlap with schema migrations. Um, any questions so far about anything? Forgot to ask a question. Um, feel free to ask at any time. Okay, data migrations. Um, so sometimes you'll do a schema migration and you'll change your database, but you realize I actually can't change that in the database without losing all of my data. Um, and perhaps that can be a serious problem. So SOP allows you to do data migration. And let's say, for example, that in our author's model, if you, I don't know if you noticed, but we had a date of birth. Because someone had the brilliant idea that for our authors, we were going to send them all birthday cards. Well, as we've gone and developed our blogging site, we realized that we, we really love to send birthday cards to all of our users, whether they're authors or not. So we kind of like to move date of birth from authors into the user profile object. Um, so we're going to go ahead and put a date of birth here, but we want it to also exist in authors because authors are related to users and to user profiles as well. So somehow we have to get this information out of the authors. Say we have 200 authors and they all put in their date of birth. We have to get that information out of the authors um, objects in the, the rows in the database. And we have to put it into these new objects that will be connected to the authors. So the thing to remember about data migration is they are almost always a sandwich of two schema migrations with a data migration in the middle. Um, so, the, and then another thing to think about when you're doing that is that the data migration will require all information to be available. So you're often like deleting something, deleting a field from one uh, model and adding it to another model. Um, and when you create that first schema migration, you have to leave all the information available so that you can move the information in the data migration and then delete the other information in the schema migration, the last schema migration. So the bottom slice, this is your schema migration. Um, I create a user auth app, and I'm going to put that user profile in it. Um, and that user profile has data birth. Now, I haven't yet removed date of birth from my author model, because if I remove it, then I won't have that information available to me in the data. 
Um, so and here it is, and it goes ahead, it migrates forward. Now we're going to create the data migration. And you do that by saying manage.py data migration app name. And then you name it whatever you want, because it doesn't automatically, it doesn't know what you want to do in the data migration. So it can't automatically create one for you. So you name it. And it's created this one, 0002, or doing birthdays. Uh, and this is just to show you what it looks like when you first create it. So it has some nice information in here. It says do not use, don't import any models. Because again, it has a dictionary of all your models at the bottom of the file. It doesn't want you to import any models. Because it doesn't want to know what's going on in your code. It doesn't want to know what's in your database. It's, it has a snapshot. Um, and then you can use uh, ORM model name to refer to models in this application. And you can use ORM with this app name model name um, for models in other applications. That's how you can access things. So here's the one that I wrote. And basically, we're just getting all of the authors, all the author objects, and then those author objects are attached to users which have profiles. So I'm going to get each profile. And now that this profile has a date of birth, I will add, uh, I'm going to set the date of birth on the profile to the date of birth, original date of birth from the author. And then I'll save it. But we also have a backwards migration. So imagine that we're going from our later migrations and we're moving back. So we don't have, we've, we've just come back to a place where in the future, we have user profiles with data births, but the authors don't have data births. So we're going to do the opposite in here. We're going to find all the author objects because, uh, oh, one second. Um, because it, we only want to find all the user objects. It's only the authors that we care about. And then we'll grab that uh, profile, and we'll move the data birth. We'll set the data birth on the profile to the data birth from the author, and then we'll save that author. Um, question? Yes. Um. <coughs> I have uh, random problems before doing this. Like, uh, uh, with, I think you can't import everything in the forwards method, or do you know, maybe it was with a custom user model or something, but like uh, other models that you don't have access to? Uh, right, so there are two things. Um, uh, what, one is that you, need, you do need to be careful that if you're working with another app, you need to use a different way of accessing those models. Um, and they, they've now updated South to sort of include that verbiage in here, so just to give you a hint. But the other way you can do it is you can, you can say dash dash freeze. When you create a data migration, um, you can freeze other apps if you want to use those, uh, those models from another app inside this migration. And what it does is it goes ahead in the, in the models dictionary, it puts those models in there as well. Um, so if you need to use models from another app, you can use the dash dash phrase tag at the end. OK, and then your top slice is another schema migration, which will remove the date of birth from the author's model. So really the thing to remember about data migrations, and the, and the thing that trips most people up about data migrations is that you start off by, you know, I will first add the date of birth, and then to the user profile, and I'll remove it from the author. Well, once you've removed it from author, you're in trouble because you don't have the data available anymore to do your data migration. So data migrations need all the information available. So you create your first schema migration to add any sort of fields you need, data migration to move data over, and then your second schema migration is where you can remove those fields that are redundant. OK. Um, so I'd like to throw in something about model inheritance, even though it's really not a South thing, it's actually just a Django ORM thing. But because you interact with, you really just interact with the Django ORM, you don't actually really interact with the database very often. I almost never do um, in terms of like writing SQL queries. Uh, so uh, the only times you'll really need to look deeply into things like model inheritance and how it's saved to the database is when you're writing a South migration, like a data migration in South. So let's just say, for example, that we have these models. We have a creature model, um, which is abstract. We have a sea creature model, which is also abstract. And we have a land creature model. This is also abstract. We have a cat. Um, and these are inheriting from the creature. Cat is a land creature. It's not abstract. 
fish is a sea creature, it's not abstract. Um, and when you create the schema migration for this, it only creates two uh, tables. It creates a cat table and a fish table. So these abstract models that we have up here are not saved to the database. But, uh, and this happened in, a, uh, in a, uh, an application that I was working on, is it was a huge number of models, all of them you know, inheriting from, from trees of inheritance, giant trees of model inheritance. And somewhere in the middle of one of those trees, somebody forgot to put abstract equals true. And so we ended up with this, this you know, database structure that functioned. It was perfectly functional, but it looked right in the database and it made data migration difficult. And so it was it just ended up being strange. And so I just thought it was interesting and I thought I would bring it up because you know, other people might find it interesting too. So if we change these from true to false and we run the same migration, then it is now adding four models. Right? And the sea creature model is going to have underwater speed. And the fish model is going to have a foreign key to the sea creature model. So any questions about that? Is that maybe everybody else that's really clear? Uh, I thought it was really kind of cool and interesting to see how the ORM actually interacts with the database in terms of model Americans. Yeah. If you had a second sea creature. Mm -hmm. Uh, now you, if you have abstract equals true and you don't make a sea creature table, yep. you've now got underwater speed in both tables. So if you wanted to do a query about underwater speed, you'd have to go to two tables. Whereas if you had abstract equals false, you could query underwater speed in the sea creature. If you wanted to do analytics on underwater speeds. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's, that's a performance question. And I don't think I come in to talk about performance. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, well, I'm just, I, I want to make sure I'm understanding it correctly. Mm -hmm. That it, it actually pulls it out. It's not redundant yes. storage. That's it's correct. just a matter of whether or not you want to have all of the things together in the one table or if you want to have that middle layer with the foreign key. Yeah. Okay. That is true. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't really, again, like I said, it doesn't change anything in your code, although it's possible it'll change the performance of your code. Right. Um, but it changes the way that it's actually saved, stored in the database itself. Yeah. Okay, um, this is kind of the end of my talk. I thought I would talk about some interesting and hairy uh, things that we've done. Um, like moving, this was moving, uh, it was like moving a, an object into uh, with taking a, a, essentially what was kind of a user object but wasn't a user object, it was like a related to a user object into like a user profile, which is a totally separate app and moving everything, an entire object, you know, ripping it out and putting it into another app. Um, so just kind of the interesting things, um, we, uh, we take all of the, uh, in this case we're going to call them animals, uh, so we take all the animal objects um, and we keep a separate table or a separate um, list of the many to many fields because getting all the many to many fields to, to move properly is not, not super simple. Um, but essentially for each field in the, um, the object that we are moving, that we're going to get rid of, um, everything except for the ID, which is going to auto-increment. We go ahead and set that attribute on the object that we're moving it to. So we just set attribute from that attribute in the original one. But if it's a many-to-many -many field, <coughs> then we just store it. And then we, we store that field, so we know which fields to query. And then we go through those fields, and we get all of the attributes, and we add all of them to this profile, and then we save the profile. So 
the, the tricky part about this is that your many, many fields are not going to be simple to move. So we kind of kept track of them all in a list, and then went through each one of those things in the list, and then you just grab all of them in bulk and add them to it. Um, and then the other interesting thing about this is um, there are sequence tables uh, in your database, and those basically say, like, how to auto increment, where to start that auto increment. And in this case, it turned out that we, it wasn't getting triggered properly as it was going through this data migration. So what we ended up doing was getting how many there were, and then setting that, we're actually executing a SQL query here, um, to set that number after you've added all of the profiles, then you find how many there are, and then you set that in the sequence table separately. This is actually, the sequence table is a problem that I've run into a couple of times with some migrations where you're, you're rolling back and rolling forward, and then you know odd things can happen sometimes. And um, I was on the south uh, IRC channel, um, and I think it was, I think it was Andrew Gottman who was like, yeah, you need to alter your sequence table, just, do, just run this. I was like, Really? Wow, OK. So yeah, that, that is the thing that you can do um, if you run into problems where you're, where you're uh, it, 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 what, what you end up with is a message where it says um, the ID, that an object with that ID already exists in your, in your table. Um, and so this is a way that you can kind of get around that issue. Yeah, so are you? In your migration, you're pulling the ID that it has in its current <laughs> incarnation and migrating that same ID, so it's keeping the ID it already has, correct? You, you can do that, yes. In, in this particular Well, in this particular thing, we are not. So we are not keeping the ID, and it should be auto-incrementing the ID. Um, I think... I think you can do it just as easily with the ID. Um, but we wanted to allow it to auto increment. I, I was just wondering if you ran into issues with the number of records in your database, even if the IDs are added sequentially, My is not ID necessarily the same exactly. as the count. Yeah. Because yeah. you might delete a record, but exactly. it takes it, you know, it's like writing void on a check in your right. checkbook and you count the checks that that process, you're off. Exactly. That's a great point. So I'm a little new to migrations, but I get the idea of self. How do I, after I've written a data migration and run it, how do I know that I did it right? Is, do I test it somehow? Or? I can't believe you asked that question. You're a plant. How did that happen? Um, plants so, and animals. You know, this was a case in which we were actually kind of worried. And we were like, you know, we got all of these things that we're moving, and we want to make sure that it actually happened. Um, and I looked up how do you how do you write tests for migrations, and I tell you, I was very unhappy to find that a lot of people were saying, oh, you don't need to test migrations. I was like, what? No, oh, you should test the data migrations. I was like, are you crazy? So um, then there were some people who said, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the best place to put the task of your data migration is inside your data migration. Because that's really the only place that you have that schema and data available to you. So that's what we did. Um, and here it is. Uh, you notice at the top of this file, this animal count is animal objects count. And that's only, the only purpose of that is purely to run this test. So the first test that we did was to make sure that the count of the original objects is equal to the count of the, the new objects. Um, and then we also went ahead and we, you know, we picked one and just made sure that, you know, I think that's what the IDs match up. Um, and then we also made sure that the user matched up for, for one of them. You could do that for a number of them. Um, so you can run, you can do some other testing around this. You can put some other tests in here. Uh, but that was that was what, it, I, I'm not super satisfied with that as the answer, but that was the answer that I found. Yeah. Is the self-documentation for a set at all? Not that I found. Um, 
Um, and that's it. So if anybody has questions, I'll be happy to attract and answer them. Yes. Can you use South to migrate data into Django? So let's just say that I've got like an existing PG app or something, and I want to bring in Django. Can I use South for that? I mean, uh, I would say fixtures are probably better. Um, I've seen fixtures that read out of the CSV file. Um, I'm not sure that, I mean, I'm trying to think of, of I really don't think so. And, and part of the reason is because um, it's designed to read out of the database that you currently have um, and interact with the data that's in there. So it's just not. I mean, you could, if you wanted, write, write a skim or a data migration that read out of a CSV file and then um, interacted that way. There's no reason why not. Um, and in fact, now that I think about it, the nice thing about it is that it does um, block it in terms of a moment in time, in terms of your database. So in that way, it's kind of better than fixtures because it's not going to get run you know, at some other moment. Um, it'll get run at a very particular time. So you know what? It actually could be a really good way to do that. Yeah. It's just to, or to add or comment on that. Could you, if you had a bunch of data in uh, like Postgres or whatever, and it was in different applications, one maybe or two different applications, would the best thing to do be use Postgres functionality to like migrate that into a new database, and then whatever changes you're going to make to that, uh, is you're going to use the HMA right now, and then start with like make sure to the models that match that, and then try to migrate from there. Like, just have a bunch of data in the database and schema that has like uh, a, a lot of logic in it or anything like that's what we want. Then you have to write Django models to match that. Is there like yeah. what well, did anyone done this before? Good thoughts on taking an existing database from a completely different yeah, I, uh, I got some code that, that does that. There, there's some Django classes that help you model legacy data. So basically what you do is you create a new model based on this legacy data. And so you pull out the fields and you assign it to this new model. Then you, use your, then you can use your new model and import it into a new, into a new Django based uh, application. And with the data? How do you migrate from the data? Oh, uh, you, you just do the scripts to suck, suck the data out of the sign it to this legacy model, model then put it into your new database. The model, the model of the new, of the new app. And you're doing those scripts rather than as a, as a data migration? Uh, yeah, you, I mean, you're basically doing your own data migration. I don't think South would have any way of doing that because you'd have to sort of figure out how to define the new model within South so you can figure out how to pull it in basically into your uh, existing app. That makes sense. So do you write the Django model in the database that you have Write those just to try to match the, the database schema that you have. No, you don't have to do that. What you can do is um, basically you're writing some new Python code. So you're basically defining some new models that pull the data from this legacy database. These new models could actually be exactly the same as the models in your your new application, but chances are the models don't match exactly. So you're going to have to do some sort of finagle and figure out because you might have a new model that say represents I don't know a fruit. But the old one might represent stuff in a totally different way, where it's got like vegetables and the fruit is a subclass of vegetable, or something, or something that thinks tomatoes and tomatoes or fruit or vegetables. But, you know, so, so you may need. I mean, it really depends how your uh, how your model is set up. Think you should practice. Uh, maybe afterwards we can talk about. We can talk about your reverse engineering database and the models that you mixed up.
placed on like a very active cable. And so we actually had a situation where we had to disable um, like permissions, read and write permissions on, on a specific cable, and like kill active queries and do just a lot of kind of hand holding to the database, then like make the schema change and then you know undo all those tickets. Uh -huh. And yeah, so given that maybe there were probably things on the database level we you know could be doing different. I'm just wondering if you or anyone has had like a thorny migration instance like that that was either help or harm. Right? So I had it. I mostly use Postgres. That's in, in <laughs> part because <laughs> despite that, because you know before Postgres that was the pain to set up and you know it's, it's much more strict. The fact that it's much more strict um, makes it much cleaner and you just don't end up with running into those kind of problems. But, but I don't know if anybody else has run into those sorts of issues migrating between different versions of MySQL or between Postgres and MySQL. Okay, yeah, I'll take it as you know, something to push itself on the database end. And I'd go through a few reasons so, after. So, thank you. I will say that I, uh, I don't recommend putting any data that you want to preserve into a SQLite database and then trying to move that to a Postgres or MySQL database. SQLite is very liberal about what it will let you put into fields, whereas Postgres and MySQL are very strict. So if you try to migrate the data, you'll run into all kinds of problems. And learn that the hard way. Even between MySQL, yeah, even between MySQL and Postgres, sometimes there are issues like that. Postgres is just more strict than that. Do you, actually, I uh, just want to comment, you have a beautiful dress there. <laughs> yeah. um, do you have any, um, do you have any, do you have any opinion on uh, cell two and like what is about the brain? Like, do you know anything about it? I don't. I would love to start that conversation because I would love to know. I tend to be very much like, what can I do right now, you know? Um, but yeah, I would love to, you know, especially if you're ever doing some stuff, again, me talking about LT, that would be great. Yeah. Can we go back to the uh, uh, feng shui slide? <laughs> sure, yeah. Because that left me just a little bit wanting for, I guess a little confused, um, yep. is that, so what we're dealing with with migrations is a sequence number, or sort of strict sequence number rather than using some kind of time-based like UID that would order. Because that seemed to me that that would, you know, at, I mean, I'm just trying to think of how to address. Is this, you know, just trying to minimize? That's not the only problem, though. So remember that each migrate, each schema migration contains a frozen image of what it believes to be the database at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. So if I develop, and if developer one has you know, migrations two, three, and four, and developer two of migrations two, three, and four, they are not going to include each other's, the changes in each other's code. They're going to continue going along as if those changes had never happened. And that can, down the road, lead to a lot of small problems that can lead to conflicts. And I, I, I see that there's problems here. I'm just trying to, it's just, it's, this is one part that's bothering me, trying to figure out a cleaner way of, mm. Of dealing with this rather than just try to, I mean, with, with this is, you know, minimize the cross section of code that you're trying to change when you're impacting the database. But sometimes it can be really hard to do that. Um, you have to be really careful. I mean, I mean, practices kind of broadening out from there of looking at decoupling um, from, you know, your other code. Like, think about, you know, you know, do your model first, or maybe this is what you're saying, do your model first. And then after you know what you model you're going to do, then do the functionality around your modeling changes. Um, but you know, development tends not to happen that way. It tends to right. all happen together. And all <laughs> happen. <laughs> yeah. So that's why this is just one part of it that just that, that, that bothers me. Just I want to understand kind of navigating around this better. So were you talking about um, maybe a possible improvement to South that South is up rather than using number systems, you know, numbered uh, name migrations, could use time-based migrations? In part, I mean, it's, it's kind of a multi, multi prong approach for it. It's in part is recognizing um, where the, the, the time um, uh, changes are, and then recognizing, ah, there are conflicts here. 
Um, so I guess, guess kind of being smarter about the, about the merge, or maybe there's a way that it can. I mean, but you're also talking about. I mean, you're talking about two systems. You're talking about the South system. You're talking about Git. Um, so you're, you're you 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 know increase your complexity at significant level, you know more than just linear. Right. Well, and, and also you, like I've had you know five or more different Git branches that I'm doing work in or code reviewing or you know, and, and they all have different migrations. You know, they're active at that time, and so in each one you have to be pretty careful. You have to be like, oh, now I got to roll back. Okay, I'm going to roll forward. Now I'm going to you know make sure that I'm in the right moment in South history. But, I mean, South, I avoid using South Merge as much as possible um, because it occasionally fails. Um, it's the same as merging in Git. You know, Git merges tons of stuff perfectly well. It does a great job. You know, hundreds of files. And it'll, you know, it'll conflict in two. But it can't figure out what we're But the thing about South migrations is that, you know, it's really easy to figure out a it is much less easy to figure out, you know, rewrite uh, a South migration properly, knowing what everybody else was was doing and what the data where the database was at that point in time. You have to go through all, read through all the model dictionaries, and you know, figure out what everybody wanted to do. And it's mm -hmm. less less fun. <laughs> it is less fun and awesome than uh, conflicts in Git. And part of it is just there isn't a good tool like Git conflicts. You can just see them, like it's really clear. You can be like, oh, this one's red, and this one's green, and this one is, you know, whatever. And I'm pretty sure that that's from the earlier version, and this is what that person changed. Whereas um, there isn't a good like, visual tool for South migrations to see, like, oh, well, this is what this migration was doing, and that's what that migration was doing. You have to like read each file, and you can. It, it depends on how many you have. If you just have two, it probably is fine. But if you have a bunch of South migrations, and you're trying to manually <laughs> make those functions together, it's really painful. So that's why I mentioned this, because it's just my philosophy to avoid self merges completely, at all possible, and only do a self merge when it really can't be avoided. Um, and self merges work great, most of the time. Perhaps to uh, address his concern, you could, um, and I don't know how descriptive you want to be with this, but prior to pushing out a change, you do a pull first, and then make your changes, and then do a push right back, so that you always know whatever, you know, because if you do this, but somebody else on the development side doesn't pull your change, then they're still working with the old model. So just try and make that yeah. that window of overlap as small as possible. Yep. Because when it comes to uh, a data model, no matter what system you're using, on some level there's no way to automate reconciling that because there are choices of how you want to structure your data. And that's not something, at least at this stage of development in artificial intelligence, <laughs> it, you, you can't ask an automated system to blindly do that because they don't know what your business rule is. And, and that does this actually brings up a good point, which is that when you, you know, let's say you're doing this thing where you're being careful, you're not actually pushing up anything. You're only you're going to push your uh, migrations to develop right away. You know, I may have a migration that I haven't pushed yet, and then I'm going to pull in someone else's code, and there's another migration that's labeled the same as mine. I still have to kind of, you know, okay, I'm going to roll back mine, like delete that file, like redo mine as a number after pairs, and then I got to make sure I push mine. There's still some little bit of kind of managing and cleanup to do, even if you're following this kind of scheme. Thanks, Thank you, everybody.